Hi, I'm Norm Abram. Welcome to the New Yankee Workshop, where today we're going to build this wheelbarrow. It incorporates some of the best ideas from the past and from today. For instance, it has removable sides, an old idea that makes the wheelbarrow a much more versatile tool. Yet we've installed a modern pneumatic tire, which allows it to carry heavy loads and roll smoothly. Now, we never realized how important the wheelbarrow was in New England history until we made a visit to the Eric Sloan Museum in Kent, Connecticut. That's next, right here on the New Yankee Workshop. The New Yankee Workshop features the craftsmanship of Norm Abram. Have you any idea what it's like for someone who appreciates tools as much as I do to be in a place like this? A temple of tools. We're in the Eric Sloan Museum in Kent, Connecticut. He was a famous artist, writer, and as you can see, collector of tools. There's so many things to look at, but today I want to show you his wheelbarrow collection. Over here in the corner is probably the largest wheelbarrow I've ever seen, about six and a half feet long. And can you imagine the size of the payload that'll fit in that box? Or even better than that, can you imagine what it might be like to try to lift it and push it around? Now, there are some interesting wheelbarrows that they've placed outside that I want to show you also. Eric Sloan is buried here. His ashes sit beneath this piece of granite that is inscribed with the epitaph that he himself wrote. Now, over here are the other two wheelbarrows. The first one is a little unusual. It's a convertible model. You could use it with this cradle for corn stalks or long material. Or you could remove the cradle and install these side panels and a front piece, much like the one I showed you inside, for different types of cargo. Now over here is a really old wheelbarrow. This is an apple picking wheelbarrow. And Sloan actually used this in some of his illustrations. Now you could buy this wheelbarrow from Montgomery Ward for $2.69. I think we've got some good inspiration visiting here. Not only did we look at old wheelbarrows, but I thought it would be useful to look at some modern versions, like this contractor's wheelbarrow, a commercial wheelbarrow that's four-sided and really meant to carry semi-liquids like concrete or mortar. Here we use it in the garden to move soil and rocks and so forth. And we're not always faithful to tipping it on the side so no water will collect. And look what happens. You start to get some rust through. But it is a classic, and with its oak handles, and most importantly, this pneumatic tire, it works pretty well. So after looking at all the features of the antique wheelbarrows and the modern, here's what we came up with. A wheelbarrow made mostly out of oak and some metal hardware that I fabricated right here in the shop. And it incorporates the pneumatic tire. Now, you won't mix any concrete in this, but you will be able to carry a fair size load. And the sides are removable, so you can carry larger items like a bale of peat moss or hay. And it'll also hold a fair amount of firewood. But the thing that I really like about this wheelbarrow, compared to most of its commercial cousins, is that it's pretty to look at. Now, if you'd like to build an exact copy of the wheelbarrow, a measured drawing and a materials list is available. And you'll hear more about that before this program ends. I'd also like to take a moment to talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. Now, to get started on this project, the first thing that I did is using the materials list that comes with the plan, I cut all the pieces of oak that I needed for the wheelbarrow, and they're to approximate sizes. Now I'm ready to start fine-tuning all the parts, and we'll start with this long piece, which is for the handles. And at the very front end of the handle, there's a slight angle. This is not 90 degrees. It's 84 degrees. And that angled cut is best made at the power miter box. There's no 90 degrees on my miter box. But if I move it over 6 degrees, what's left is 84 degrees.
That takes care of the handles for now. Now this next piece right here, a shorter piece, is to go across the front of the two handles. And the ends need to be cut at a 96 degree angle. Now I'm not going to change anything at the miter box. Leave it where it's set and trim one end. Now the result is that this angle is 84 degrees, but the complementary angle is the 96 degrees that I want. Now it's just a matter of measuring the length. In this case, 9 inches from the short point to the short point. Put a little mark to show I want it angling that way. Set it back in and cut it off. I've laid out my front piece for this little rabbit right here. And now I've set my table saw to six degrees to make the cross cuts. I'm going to use this little tenoning jig to make the rip cuts that I need. And for three-quarter inch stock, this little toggle clamp works fine. But for thicker material, I'm just going to use an accessory clamp, this little bar clamp. And you just clamp it securely in place and run it through. Now while I'm at the table saw, I want to make a groove on the inside of this front piece for a threaded rod that really secures everything together. And I'll do that at the table saw just using the blade, making a couple passes, and moving the fence. I suppose I could set up a dado head, but this is just as quick. Now for the legs, and I'll cut both legs out of this blank. The legs are slightly tapered, a little bit wider at the top than they are at the bottom. So to cut those, I'll use my homemade tapering jig, which has an infinite number of selections. I've already adjusted it for the taper I want and set the rip fence in the right position. Just going to leave the line. The next thing to do is to cut the legs at the top where it meets the handle. And that's going to be 15 degrees. So we'll do that over at the miter box. Now let's talk about some of the connections where the leg meets the handle, where the strut meets the handle, where the strut meets the leg, where this cross brace laps over itself and where it ties into the leg, all those joints are a form of a lap joint. And the best way to remove the material to make the lap joint is to use the radial arm saw, which is set up with the stacked dado head cutter. By changing the angle and the height of the saw, we can make all the cuts that we need. Now I've clamped the pieces together here loosely to show you what happens at the cross brace for the legs. Because the handles get wider at the back and because the leg tips back slightly, the cross brace doesn't sit flat against it like this. It actually sits at a slight angle. And that complicates things a little bit because I can't make just a straight notch in the leg. I need a angled notch. So to do that, I made a couple jigs to help me at the radial arm. The first jig is this piece, which is simply cut at a six degree angle. 
and that corresponds to the flare of the handles. Now, if I put the leg blank on that, I still have a problem. Because the leg is tapered, it's too low down at this end. So I made another piece, which is a wedge that goes from nothing to a half inch. And if I slip that under the leg blank, now this top edge is parallel to the table. When I run the radial arm through, I'll have a dado that's a little bit deeper on the back side here than it is on the front, which is exactly what I want. Where the pieces for the cross brace pass by one another, I want to make a half lap joint. It's just a matter of a flat angled notch. No special jigs needed here. Let's see how this brace fits in there. Okay, I think that's going to be fine. All right, now before I do any assembly, there's still a few more things I want to do to the handle pieces. I've attached these little pine blocks because right along this line I need a half round hole for the axle. And in order to guide the bit so it has something to go into, this block will help me with that. Now over here I also want to drill a quarter inch hole for the threaded rod that ties the front together. Now over here at the drill press I've tilted the table six degrees and installed this straight edge clamp as a guide. And I'm going to bore a hole about an inch or so deep for that axle. With the straight edge clamp reinstalled on the table closest to me, I'm ready to drill the hole in the other handle for the axle. Same angle on the drill press table to drill the quarter inch hole for that threaded rod. I'm using a little template made out of poster board to lay out the grips at the end of the handles. Then I'll rough them out on the bandsaw. Now I'm just going to take a little bit off of each side of the handles in the area of the grip. Well, a three-quarter inch roundover bit set up in my router makes this step a lot easier. Well, now I'm ready to start assembling the frame. And all the joints will be secured with a little bit of construction adhesive in either screws or carriage bolts. You might have noticed that I'm using a square drive screw. They're real nice to drive. These happen to be stainless steel. They really pull it together and they'll never rust. And this threaded rod will help hold the assembly together.
one more carriage bolt right in the center of the cross brace. Now here are all the parts I need for my wheel mechanism, and I got them all at my local hardware store. First, the pneumatic tire, which is really sold as a replacement for the contractor's wheelbarrow. And for an axle, I bought some solid round stock, 5 eighths of an inch in diameter, and it fits just right. I was lucky. It fits just right in these hardened bushings. And I needed some spacers, so I picked up some 3 quarter inch electrical conduit and made a couple spacers that slip onto each side of the wheel. Now this whole setup drops into the handles. And the reason I have these little spacers is to stop the wheel from moving side to side. And I notched it over the rail so that it won't spin and actually drill through the wood. I also bought some flat stock. And this happens to be galvanized, which means it won't rust, which is a good idea. And I cut some short pieces to hold everything in place. The bar sits over the bushing and the axle, and I'll bolt it all down with some little lag screws. OK, now you can start to see what happens as I tighten the lags. The strap bends around the axle, securing it in place. Hey, look at that. Works pretty good. Well, the frame's built, and I think it's time to call it a day. We can easily finish it up tomorrow. Good morning. I got started today by cutting some pieces of oak, four pieces in all that'll make up the frame for the bottom of the tray. And it's slightly tapered. It gets narrower at the front. Now over here at the prototype, you can see that the corners of the frame are joined with a simple half lap joint that I'll make over at the radial arm. I'm using a little bit of construction adhesive at all the joints. And then I'm going to nail them together, all four corners. Let's go to the next step. Well, I'm now milling a little rabbit in the frame, and that's going to support the plywood deck. The plywood deck is 3 quarters of an inch thick. I'm using a 3 eighths inch rabbiting bit to make the rabbit, so I'll have to make a few passes to get it to the right depth. plywood that I'm using for the base of the tray is known as MDO plywood. It actually has a paper surface on it. It's very tough and durable. Some construction adhesive and some stainless steel screws will hold the plywood in place and actually give this frame a lot of strength. I wanted the sides of my wheelbarrow to flare out. And that means that the edge of the bottom of the tray also has to have a flare. And the easiest way to do that is over on the joiner. I've tipped the fence to 10 degrees, and I'll just run it through a couple times. These holes that I drill in the corners of the tray frame for the carriage bolts that are going to hold it all together. These holes are for the bolts that will secure the tray to the frame. Finally, the bolts that join the corners of the tray frame. Had I put them in any earlier, they would have interfered with the base of the router and the joiner. 
Now this little piece of oak is a wedge that I ripped on my table saw, which I had set at 25 degrees. And it will establish the angle for the front of the wheelbarrow. I'll hold it in place with some construction adhesive and screws. I've just milled a couple oak channels, and what they do is hold the front of the tray in place. There's one at the top and there's one at the bottom. Now the one on the bottom, when I slip it in here, I'm gonna have to remove some additional material so that the panel will fit tight against the wedge. I wanna take this material out. Okay, I've clamped the lower channel in place, and now I'm going to attach the front with a couple screws. The top channel is next, and that gets held in place with one screw in the middle. These strips of oak with a little dado cut in the middle are to really conceal the threaded rod, which is going to keep the sides of the wheelbarrow from falling off. It fits into the channels. And I'm going to put a screw at the top so that it won't pop out. The screw head later is covered by the metal brace at the front of the wheelbarrow. Boy, I'll tell you, this old machinist vise really comes in handy trying to bend this flat stock to make the little braces for the front of the wheelbarrow. And it's going to be a little bit of trial and error, but I'll get them shaped. Okay, that's good. Okay, that takes care of the front braces. Now I can start working on the sides. They're pieces of 1 by 10 oak. And if I slip it in here and you look down here, you can see that because the side is flared, it doesn't sit flat on the bottom. So I'm going to bevel the bottom edge at 10 degrees using my joiner. I used my bevel gauge to set my radial arm saw for the cut along the front of each side piece. It works out to be about 25 degrees. Okay, the sides come with two cleats. They both act as stiffeners, but the one at the back is a little bit longer and it sticks down because it's actually a stake that fits in a little metal bracket. That's what I'm going to make next. Okay, that takes care of the brackets. Now, what do you think we should use for a finish on this? Oak outside. Guess I better think about that for a while. You know, it took me a long time to decide what to finish our old-fashioned wheelbarrow with. I was afraid that if I used a urethane or a varnish 
that it would chip after a while and then the wood would be exposed to moisture. Same thing would happen with paint. But I did recall years ago a method of preserving wooden ladders and that was to put on coats of boiled linseed oil. So what I'm doing here is putting on a couple coats now and then I'll put a coat on every year or so as needed. But you have to make sure to use the boiled oil, otherwise it will never dry. Come on. <laughs> Come on. Well, now that a couple coats of oil have dried on our wheelbarrow, it almost looks too attractive to put to work. But believe me, it'll take a lot of abuse. Norm Abram is the author of the book, The New Yankee Workshop, which is available in bookstores and libraries nationwide.